Hello world, welcome back to another tutorial. Today we're gonna to be doing code refactoring. And when I say we are doing code refactoring, I mean I am doing code refactoring because I tried recording this not long ago. It took about 40 minutes for me to get less than halfway done explaining everything that I'm doing. And it's just, it's too much time and I, I don't wanna bore you. So what I've done is I put together a time lapse of me updating code and you can go and watch that. There's some nice soothing music behind it. So yeah. Um, the reason for this refactor is I've kind of let the code get out of hand. Uh, the past few tutorials, it's been, I don't know, just me trying to apply, add things on the fly and I just needed to adjust some stuff so that the episodes in the future are a little easier to add more content and material. So without further ado, let's get into the code refactor and then I will explain everything. Let's go. Okay, so now that all that's done, we got this super flashy, fancy scene, right? Uh, it's basically just kind of a proof of concept that it's working. It's all working just fine. Um, so all in all, that code refactor took me about an hour. You can imagine if I were to have 
been explaining things along the way, you would have got bored, I would have got bored, and we would, our heads would have exploded. Um, so let's talk about exactly what I did. Uh, first, I just want to kind of talk about this scene and what I have set up right here. Um, I have a quad, uh, and then I'm just adding the quad to the scene, and then I'm setting the position of the debug camera to five. Okay, so it's fairly simple, and then I'm setting the quad's position to the cosine of the total game time that flies by. So it's just gonna be moving back and forth. Now, why, where is this cube coming from? There's a cube in the scene. So where is that coming from? Um, if I go to my game objects and I go into my quad class, I'm just adding that as a child of my quad, uh, which makes it so that the um, quad has a cube somewhat inside of it. See, I'm setting the cubes scale to 0.3. Now, the cube is moving back and forth. Why is this happening? Um, it's a child of the quad. It doesn't just happen magically. How is it knowing where to be relative to the quad? Well, the quad has, the quad is the square, by the way, if you didn't know that. Um, the quad has a model matrix, right? It has rotation, translation, and scale. Um, and so does the cube. The cube has translation, rotation, and scale. And inside of the cube class, it's doing some sort of rotation, it looks like. Um, so what you can do is for all the children that you add to, let's say the quad class or any, you know, parent class, just get, just let the children of that class know its model matrix and then multiply the mo model matrix of the parent class by the child class. And I'll show you that in the node. So what I'm talking about is I added a variable called parent model class and for model matrix now, I'm instead of just returning model matrix, which if I were to return model matrix, that would do something like this, where the cube doesn't move alongside of the quad. Just to, just to show you, see the, the cube stays in one spot, but the quad moves back and forth. Well, and that's, you know, that's not that good because, you know, we want to put this quad out in space somewhere. We want all the objects that are attached to that to be relative to the center the origin of the actual object the parent object so what you can do is create a parent model matrix and every time you call update on all the children just check, set the child parent model matrix to your current model matrix and then the multiplication will happen right here where it combines the two model matrices and creates you know a translator rotated scaled parent child relationship matrix. I don't know. Uh, so that's the first thing I did. Let's keep going through the node class on all the things I did because there's kind of a bit. So I added an ID. Um, the ID is going to be this uid.uid string. Um, basically, this just creates a random series of letters and characters. This will be good for if we want to store into a dictionary. We'll have like, you know, a, a random generated GUID kind of um so there's an id uh as a matter of fact let's just print it that out so you know what it looks like because it's probably good that we visualize these things um so i'm gonna up put, push this up it's gonna run and then over here you'll see it says optional but see these random like hash strings these are what were generated right when the object was loaded, and then we can use these as a key or something later. So I'm just giving him a random ID for the current state they're in. Um, I'm gonna remove this print self ID. I'm gonna move this down. Uh, the next thing I did inside of here was I added this do update function. So anytime you need to override the update function on a child, like, or on a, on a class that inherits a node, don't call, don't override update, because you're gonna have to always do super.update. Instead, use this do update that doesn't need to be overridden by parent and classes. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Just So we'll have this do update function. Um, I moved the rendering of the, the renderable uh, above the children rendering because I kind of want to render me first and then my children can be rendered in front of me as they go in front of me. Um, and then I added this huge, long uh, extension right here. So let's go through it. Basically, it's just a bunch of getter and setters. I didn't want to have any of these properties available just to the world. So I added some convenience methods. Instead of calling node.position.x equals node.position.x plus, you know, or plus equals, it's just ridiculous. So I created like move x, um, get position x, set position y, uh, just these nice convenient 
convenience methods and then um, we'll be able to call all of those on any node class yeah um, also they should have a name this name will be what gets printed out during the uh, like if you do debugging which we covered in the last episode and yeah uh, these are now private it's basically I just made cleaned up this class to be a lot cooler uh, the next thing I did is I went through and um, I created graphics and entities so right now we have in entities a mesh library so let's, let's start with the top level class we have entities right here entities is a really cool singleton class that I can call from anywhere and grab say meshes so um, you know I can call entities dot meshes and then what I've done is for each library in these entities and graphics because they you know I we have all these library classes from before I've created this default library class um, and that's gonna be in the core types library now so we have core library and this library is just something that I can override all the time and basically its job is just to fill the library upon initialization and then provide this subscript operator so the subscript is kind of so when you access an array at an index you do square brackets at you know the indice that you want to grab from that array well the subscript is that square bracket notation um, so inside of our objects say let's go to our game shiz and go to game object um, for graphics, you see we say graphics dot render pipeline states basic. So we do graphics, which is this file, render pipeline states, which goes into this file right here, and then we get the dot basic, which would return the basic file or ba basic render pipeline descriptor. And it's just because we overwrite it like so. So here's here's the actual implementation of a library class. Um, I'm going to go back to the mesh library. So we have our library, which is our dictionary. We fill our library. We don't need to call this on initialize. And then we have our subscript operator, which returns, you know, whatever at that index, the square brackets. So that's, that's pretty cool stuff. Um, our shader class is now a lot easier to make. It's more dynamic. So in vertex shader, by the way, this used to be just shader library. I've split it out into vertex shader library and fragment shader library. Um, we can just create shaders like this as opposed to cre creating just a bunch of different classes called basic vertex shader with the same code. Just made it so that we're not copying and pasting too much more code. And I did the same for the fragment shader types. Uh, vertex descriptor library, like I said, just a, all, all these libraries are exactly the same. I didn't really modify any you know, functional code. I just kind of made them better, made the code better. Um, yeah, moving through, uh, I will, I also did the same for the render pipeline state. This used to be, you know, a bunch of classes, basic render pipeline state, et cetera, render pipeline state, but the render pipeline state is, you know, if we want to override it, we can, if we want to create some special case, but for the most part, we won't need to do that. We'll have a render pi pipeline descriptor that will represent all the settings on the render pipeline state. So this will be the important part for the render pipeline state. And then when we have this library, we'll just make sure to pass in the render pipeline state descriptor type that we need. Uh, going to the shaders. So graphics and entities, right? So in graphics, we have shaders because that's kind of a part of the graphics aspect of it. Um, I created a shared.metal file that will store all of the so if we want to create different shader files, as opposed to just storing, you know, 9,000 million lines in this file, which we don't want to do. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'll do this right now. Um, I'll create a new file and I will make it a metal file and I'll show you exactly what I mean. This will be instanced shaders. Um, and then we'll rename this my shaders to basic shaders. Oh, not B that metal. This will rename this to basic shaders dot metal um, and this will have our basic vertex shader and our basic fragment shaders and then we can take this instance vertex shader out of here put it into the instance shaders dot metal class and then just make sure that we include the uh, shared 
that metal class from above. And um, if we try to build that, it should work just fine. So now all of our metal files can be separated out into a bunch of different files, and we'll just have this one shared file among all of them. So we don't need to redefine anything inside of them. Um, so that's our shaders. Uh, as, as you can see, the hierarchy of our files have changed. So I have types, we have our input, our math, and our utils. I'll probably add like extension files on here at some point. Um, and yeah, it's all the same stuff. It's just now we have our uh, nice organized code. Uh, so types is gonna hold all of our basic object types that belong in the core. So the core is like where we grab everything that we, like if, if we wanna share modules or code across a bunch of stuff, this is where we'll wanna start in the core. And so this will be just basically objects that we wanna put in there uh, and our metal types. So that's pretty dope. Um, yeah, our camera now is not a protocol. It is it is just inherited from Node. So it will have a model matrix and it'll have position and all that stuff. So view matrix will just be, you know, the opposite of get position. Um, but yeah, now camera will inherit from Node. And then our debug camera is cool. Now, this is a good chance for me to show you what I mean by when we added all those helper functions in the Node. You see we have self.movex as opposed to going self.position dot x minus equals and then as you can see i'm using do update and then i have this delta time, game time dot delta time so i would have i would have minus equals game time dot delta time and then like this is annoying <laughs> that's super annoying so uh yeah that's why these helper methods are nice now this is a good chance for me to show you so we have move X. All right. So also I created a new class called game time dot Delta time. And what this is, is it is a class. Um, where the hell did I put it? I put it in core game time. So it's a class that basically just tracks total game time and game uh, Delta time per frame. That's all it's for. And it's a singleton class. And it's, it's just nice to be able to grab each one of these little like total game time and delta times from anywhere in the game as opposed to passing it all the way through each function. So I'm not doing that anymore. Um, and that is being updated in our scene manager. So our scene manager has now, when we tick a scene, we do game time dot update time um, with the delta time. And then that's the only place where we actually use that delta time. Um, camera manager stayed the same. Everything else kind of stayed the same. I added a quad class. That's about it. But yeah, um, yeah. If you like these code changes, let me know. I, it took a lot longer. It was just a bunch of monotonous work that I didn't want you to have to watch me do. So yeah, if you liked it, let me know. If uh, if there's any other code changes you want me to do, I will. I'll just do another real quick refactor episode, and then yeah. Thanks for watching.